Thank you, Yanis. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, as Yanis said, this, this is a project that developed a few years ago while I was studying um, in reaction to the data industry that I kind of had found out about or discovered after the Snowden revelations. Um, what you're looking at here is basically I decided to push the whole thing into a frame of a form of extreme capitalism. So by looking at the structure of corporations, I, didn't, I saw that trade and the economy and business always requires the exploitation of something, often land, animals, or people. Um, and I wanted to, with this diagram that was an early um, visualization of this new structure, I wanted to hark back to the slave trade when ships or uh, corporations actually in England would take uh, materials that were fabric and tobacco, final products, down to Africa to trade them for people, and then over to America to trade those people for raw products and bring that back to Europe. So this is why this form has this, and this is the image that's normally up in this room. But under this extreme form of capitalism, um, I brought everything down to self-exploitation because I didn't want to exploit anything else. And so I exploit what it is to be a human mentally, physically, and biologically, such as character and genes, um, everything that embodies a person and looking at those things as property. And then the production, I am a product of my environment. I produce the body is the machine that produces all of these things, or the organism, and what makes a person what they are, so your gender or sex. And so putting all of this down under one, one structure. Um, what the, brought this on with the data industry was looking at kind of the invasiveness of technology and how it's being further embedded in our environments and in our bodies even soon, um, or if not now, and with devices and that there's ever increasing more ways to get you to spend more time in applications or in front of screens, basically. And so I started to feel really angry about this, and I think everybody should, and if you're not, you're perhaps not paying attention, although I know things are very different here. I was also really kind of concerned as an American about the future of labor. I've been, since I lived in Europe for so long, I'm a precarious worker. I was a freelancer for all those 16 years. And I could feel that coming from an arts background, that I didn't really have the skills necessary to go get a job in something that would really be salaried. So I was pretty much stuck with a wage, a wage labor. And then, it felt like this with the technology. It felt like there's no difference between developing technology to extract more of something that has value compared to a lot of people, if you see everybody walking around with their phones. And so when Snowden did come out with his revelations, everybody kind of focused on the privacy aspect. And I was a bit more, I don't know, I, I wanted to understand why and who was collecting it. So I started to look at the industry. And there are also two very different narratives that developed in Europe compared to America. If I were in America, the narrative was that a man leaks information about the NSA. So this man did something. But luckily, I was in Europe. And it was Google and governments are spying on people. And so I kind of took that narrative as a way to be offended, but also that I actually do something valuable in this economy that I didn't realize. And then when I looked further into the corporations primarily benefiting from the data extraction, I saw that their revenues were increasing drastically, and basically all of them were becoming data firms. And then I also looked to the economy and what the World Economic Forum were saying, and the Aspen Institute, and they were very much um, supporting and proponents that this is a new economy, and this is the way all companies should be planning 
to take advantage of. So that brought me back to develop this. And in a way, I decided to use the, this is Sigourney Weaver and Aliens, and I decided to use the corporate form, the container, as a, something to kind of step in and to try and fight, um, using it as a shield and sword to fight my way into and hopefully subvert through appropriation and change what a corporation can be and how things like um, intellectual property rights could be used. So I developed perhaps the most speculative thing that I've ever, ha ever had to do, which is write a business plan for what this company, what I basically would be doing with my life to make it valuable. And this is one of the documents. This is the Certificate of Incorporation, which you have over here in the center. And that was formed, so the corporation was formed on May 4th, no, May 2nd, um, 2014. So it's in a way a new birthday, which I'll show you. This is basically this video that I wanted to talk about. We are all data slaves. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of being exploited. You know who's got it made? Corporations. If companies can make money from my information, information that I generate just by being alive, then so can I. I've decided to play their game, but with a little twist, by bringing the whole process down to the individual by incorporating my identity. What's my solution? Extreme capitalism. I'm now the founder, CEO, shareholder, and product of Jennifer Lynn Marone, Inc. As a corporation, who I am, how I am, and what I do is for me to exploit, making my life, my existence, and the data I generate my business. This is not about everybody getting rich. It's about everybody getting their fair share. Let me explain how this works. I've broken down every aspect of how I am as a human into physical, mental, and biological services. Take a look over here. On my website, people can go to ask to use me. Debates to request are also transparent, so if you ask me to do something dangerous and unethical, you better be prepared to answer why. Shareholders vote on major decisions. Perhaps I'll be used for what I do best. Perhaps it will go terribly wrong. At the same time, I'm capturing and collecting as much data about myself as I possibly can, so I can analyze, package, and sell it as I see fit. I'm using all the same methods of surveillance and data collection that companies and governments do to us now. The only difference is that I'm not interested in your information. I'm only interested in collecting mine, and I'm going to be fully transparent about it all, meaning I'm making it live and public. Why? Because we're that transparent to those watching us now. As I gain control to this, with this exposure, I will become more opaque. I also want to test what's the worst that can happen. If someone steals my identity, I don't stop existing. If everything is happening out in the open, caught on camera, with sensors, every action streamed live, is there still danger? Well, you'll have to watch to find out. This is extreme capitalism. So just to point out a few um, aspects of this video, the bulldogs in the, the bulldog clips in the back are supposed to represent uh, quite obviously that the, the suit doesn't really fit me, I don't really fit the role, and it doesn't really fit me. Um, the transparency through the 360 degree track and the green screen that I really don't think I have anything to hide, but I'm not sure. Um, and some of the aspects were, some of the aspects were kind of describing the area around that was because it was done for an initial exhibition. Um, making it live in public it's kind of taken its form in the public through exhibitions um, and is occasionally online. But since I move around a lot, not all the time. This is a share certificate. 
shares are, in the beginning of a company, something that automatically comes to you with the formation of the company. And they are of no real value. They do not represent capital that exists in the company or what's in the bank. They represent the perceived value that the company might have. So in a way, you're getting a stack of paper that you deem the value of and kind of can become um, something that if you convince others of your value, then you can trade that for real currency or accepted other forms of accepted currency. So it becomes your own currency in a way. Valuations are also something that companies undergo at the beginning to figure out what that price should be that you ask for to try and see how, how much you might be worth. I decided normally it's like how many users do you expect to have or what kind of property you're going to buy, what, what um, things do you need to build. I decided to do it from what, just one level of that is how much has already been invested in me. And so I went back and asked my family how much I cost to live. Um, and then, so that was up until 18 years old. And then beyond that, how much, it was pretty much just a strict monetary uh, measure, how much did I get to live and how much had been saved and then you kind of get that number and how much other people paid for you to live. So this totaled to a few years ago over a million dollars. But I also want to point out that that doesn't mean that I'm more valuable than somebody say living in a poor country um, and that that shouldn't represent because of more money going into somebody or the more money they have that that makes them a better person. Something that you often hear in America, that person is successful, they're wealthy, they're good. And I think that's a, a narrative that needs to be broken over there. This was the design of the economies that I saw could potentially develop in this scenario where you have the person as a corporation and then there's the byproduct of data that could go to some kind of cooperative data broker and be marketed to the same industries that use it now. And then the profits that go currently or the revenues that go currently to companies would go to every individual who might be a member or something. And then on the other side was the control aspect of the idea of having shareholders. So shareholders theoretically would each have a part and say in a corporation. It doesn't really work like that because of the complicated structure that corporations can have with shares, that some can be common shares and some can be preferred shares, meaning that if you have preferred shares, you have a number of votes over everybody else. So, but if it didn't work that way, and I do it where everybody gets common shares, then you have a say, almost like a game, because in a way it is a game, I think, for shareholders, to say what I would do, how I would be used as a person, as a body, um, as a product in the environment, and whatever that exchange might happen on that level. Like, what kind of services would I provide for either money or something else I might need? And that that would be on a local level. And then this is a closer diagram of that side, the data side. So everybody's a corporation. They put their data or they put it through that data broker to manage, who manages and sells the structured data. This is this diagram here, which was looking at data from the level of well, one, not understanding very much of how it escaped me and went to these companies. So just looking at it from a very personal, immediate level, where is this going through? And trying to understand how I need to capture it as well in order to at least have a copy, because then I could copyright it. So it involves uh, basically a phone and a computer and then offline methods, like just filling out spreadsheets and having um, wearable devices and things like that. So you can see it here, sorry. And figuring out how that would all be transmitted and stored in my own server. 
which is what I could protect as a corporation, which as an individual, I have no way to do so. This is um, a real-time example of just 25 data types collected, all in sync. So this is a period, it was a specific day. At this time, my heart rate was that much, so I was walking. Um, how fast I was going, where I was, what I last looked up. Um, the last photo I took, what I just ate and how many calories, there's a photo, how many calories I burned at that point, um, the last email I had, the last text message, how I felt, how I kind of had felt that day on average, the money that went out, the money that just came in, what day of my cycle I was, whether I was bleeding or fertile, and then this is, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but line by line data being written every moment. So what, I, what the, I want this to show, this was shown in the Martin Gropius bow, and it was shown in a way where it was 25 monitors that each were playing a separate tile. And so it is the body. It's the body, but without the body. It's a human, and it's just a very simplistic way of saying, this is just a very tiny bit of information being collected, and from that, what can you start to gather about a person? and how can you begin to understand them and anticipate what they're going to do, and how that becomes something that you sell, or that is sold. So from that, I started to pull this information into packages and divided it up into different categories, um, based on often the way that we are categorized and the information is lumped together and it makes it more valuable when it is and when it's combined with other people's. And I also wanted to mimic um, the way that companies were trying to sell digital goods to people that really needed something physical. So the idea that you go to a store and you give money and you get something in return. Some people are much more comfortable with that. Even though that is not, it might be considered an artwork, but it's not what you're paying for. You're paying for what's in the product. So there's a double step to products. And then this is, this is a new aspect um, that I'm going to start working on, which is delving into the rights, because that's what it almost all comes down to, is that we're constantly signing away our rights to these companies, and there's nobody in front of you. It's just a screen, usually. And you have nobody to say, well, these are my rights. This should be a two-way agreement. So one of the ways is to have a political decision to change policy and agree that there's always a data rights owner and a data rights user, and those roles change, but that it's a two-way agreement, not just a one-way agreement. And then on the other side, it was copyright. One example that I will be trying to go through is suing Getty Images because somebody after I was a corporation, so my appearance is also trademarked. And somebody took a photo at my graduation and then put it up and you can find it on Getty Images, which I never was asked permission for. The photographer never asked me if he could take the photo. They're always sending, so kind of use their way that they go and file um, infringement letters to people all the time and say, well, you don't have the right to, to show my image without my permission, and maybe there's a fine for them to pay. And here's the, so this was supposed to be the game. It's not built yet, but where I'm kind of in this avatar situation, maybe you have it from my perspective that you see, or you see me, or you see um, a representation of the individual that is the corporation. And so things, this is where the exchange place would take place and that it's combining game environment with social media environments. So these might be the prop, the shareholders can vote on everything that I do as well and that was inviting the idea of who is accountable in these situations and whose data then does it really become if it's 
a group of people creating that information or that action or that, that event. Um, and then this is biological services. So it's looking at real markets and real prices, actually, uh, except for the eggs. It can be that much, but for me it's just because I'm older and they might be more valuable <laughs> to me than to anybody else. But those are real prices based on what people get or are willing to pay for these products, biological products. So it's also looking at the body, breaking it down to if I were a corporation and going to exploit every single aspect of me, that's what those kinds of services look like and are sold now. This is a video that's playing out in the hallway. Um, after every, well, every year, a corporation has to have an annual meeting. And even if you're the only one in the company, you have to help hold it with yourself. So I did that, <laughs> and you can see, but not hear it outside. And so it's the director, the treasurer, and the secretary. And in that I have, it's after, so it's 2015, and we're discussing the, um, the data acquired and looking at some of the results and then saying, okay, well, we're going to try and break into some new markets, which are the, I'll get into that next, but they're these data-derived products that you have in the back. And then we're also talking about the health of the company and that the company isn't doing so well physically and maybe health-wise, but we just have to maybe work it a bit harder. And it's not, so it's, it seems like it is acting and played. And of course, because I'm in it, I'm badly acting in it and not very well, but it was really accounted for and it's called meeting minutes because the way that it's done, it's a narration of what happened in the meeting. It's not a line for line um, account of what was said, but just a description of what was roughly talked about. So into the products I, we decided to roll out were based on looking at other markets and industries, um, particularly diamonds, and even more specifically, diamonds made from human remains or ashes, and things like hair. And the top one are perfumes and how you know, often celebrity scents are, have appeared even more and more, and how they, they kind of play on the idea, either it's the scent of that person, and if you, like Justin Bieber, um, no, there was one with Jennifer Aniston and Khloe Kardashian. They both did ones where it's, it's kind of their scent. That's what they smell like. And then there are ones that are the scents of what people like, like Justin Bieber had one, if you wear this one, I'm going to really like, love you or be after you. So it's this aspiration of what you want to smell like. And also with the pheromone um, aspect to these industries, it's not something scientifically proven, but it sells. And the last one is 23andMe. Their business model, looking at that, where it's the company that you can send some saliva to, and then they do a very basic sequence of your genetic profile and send you or make that available to you in their online platform. They change the business model so that they actually sell the database. They still sell you the kit. You give them their information. Then they have compiled this information and they sell it to pharmaceutical companies. So that aspect of taking one product and then extracting something from it um, I wanted to represent that in all of these, that you can start with one bit of information, it could seem worthless like urine, but that you can get valuable information out of there or valuable products. The Rejuvenix, which this one is, um, is a hormone that in my blood test I was very high. It was called DHEA, so I had high results for that. And so I, the company thought, okay, we'll exploit that and extract it. And so I did that to develop a product that's a hormone therapy cream, which in the US, they are sold over the counter. In the rest of the world, even China, they're banned. 
So I wanted to draw attention to these kinds of industries that skew, either skew the value drastically of the product or manipulate like diamond industries can manipulate the market by getting rid of a lot of diamonds or hiding them or dumping them in the sea. Um, but that are inherently linked to identity when you look at them in this way. In perfume, either you try and change your identity or your smell is very linked to your identity. The hair is something that's just continually through your life growing. It's a carbon-based matter. Um, and then something, a waste stream, so to harness a waste stream from your body and turn it into something of value to some others. Happiness. You know you want it. Ask your doctor about Rejuvenex. Rejuvenex is a hormone therapy treatment that may help increase energy, improve mood, sex drive, and general satisfaction with life. Rejuvenex is not for everyone. Tell your doctor about all your medical conditions and medications. Rejuvenex should not be used by women who are or may become pregnant, men with prostate cancer, women with breast or ovarian cancer, or anyone younger than 18. Side effects could include increased heart disease, prostate cancer, worsening prostate symptoms, decreased sperm count, shrinking of testicles, swelling of ankles, feet, or body, or enlarged or painful breasts. Some people experience problems breathing while sleeping, headache, diarrhea, vomiting, blood clots in the legs, and the need to urinate frequently. Changes in body hair or increase of acne in women may occur. Ask your doctor if Rejuvenex can help you. In the U.S., there used to be, when TV started, there, or in the 50s, I guess, 60s, there was a television network, when TV first started, that was directed and for and made by um, medical professionals, so doctors. And pharmaceutical companies started to advertise to them through this format. Eventually, that network went away, but the commercials and that ability to advertise directly to the consumer stayed but the consumer became the patient, or the potential patient. And American um, commercials for pharmaceuticals come, usually the disclaimer of all the side effects is longer than the actual sale or pitch of what the benefits are. So that's a two minute or one minute long advert that I hope you'll listen to that promises happiness, virility, and longevity, like to live longer. Basically, what everybody wants, but, and will pay something for. The second one, um, the diamond, is very, very short, and it's using language and the associations that we have and tie, have tied to the diamond. Um, it is, so right now I can tell you there's classic, there's timeless, there's elegant, but then there's also imperial and fantastic for this fantasy and um, that it's, it's the symbol of love and commitment even though it's just this object that has been heavy, heavily relied on severe exploitation. And then the third advert is more of an infomercial and these two lovely ladies will do their best to make you buy this, these perfumes, which one is called Repel. So they're taken from molecules from my own body and then distilled in quite an old-fashioned way of making perfume. The black one is Repel, so it's taken from certain times of month that I maybe want to be left alone. And then the white one is called Lure. And they'll tell you why it's very worth having. And then in the center of the room, this is the paperback version that's available to buy online through Cower Fletcher Gallery, and it's empty. So that is a version that in the center of the room that I handmade. So these were collector's editions, and that I filled out with my own answers. And it's basically um, kind of a philosophical, psychological object that you are meant to interact with and encounter. And it's meant to make you, make you think about your value and it takes you on this journey of thinking about what you have to offer and what matters to you and why you would be, basically how you want to structure. And by the end, 
you're answering questions that are much more money driven. How are you going to run this? Do you, and it you, makes you go back and forth and check yourself, which is what you have to do as a company. Is this where you wanted things to go? Because it's a profit. I mean, your only intention as a corporation is to make money for shareholders or to constantly be after money. So where does that make your values lie if they're not um, something that's paid for? And so sometimes it's a bit daunting because I feel, I feel like this. It's, in a way, the whole project is a protest and it's an act of civil disobedience. And I do it alone. It's not meant to be that way, really. But how can you go up against big organizations or the whole structure of corporate culture and this legal system or that is just legal fictions and fight it as an individual? So you have people kind of cheering. He goes and stands in front. And it feels like that very often. Like I'm constantly standing in front of the, the legal system. And what this says, certain demonstrations and weekend marches are vital alone, but are not powerful enough to stop wars. They'll be stopped only when soldiers refuse to fight, when workers refuse to load weapons onto ships and aircrafts, when people boycott the economic outposts of the empire that are, they're stronger, that are strung across the globe. And what I kind of hope to say with that is that if everybody continues to use the technologies and kind of this is a concern that affects everybody, the data exploitation, but one person alone is not going to do anything and it's only, it might not be the result of us all becoming corporations, but at least recognizing the value and then trying to decide to do something about it that you might whether it's boycotting the technologies or the companies or things like that, like actually having an active role in that future, whatever it's going to be.